Hi guys, it's Debbie and today I'm back as it is finally time to look at everything I watched this month from films to series to documentaries. This way I'll be able to give you some recommendations about good titles I've watched as well as some films or series I didn't really like and also I can give my brief little review about everything I watched. Although there was no particular trend to what I watched, you'll see that the titles range from the scariest horrors to family friendly animated films this month turned out to be pretty curious. Some of the films I watched were really interesting. Um, and let's start from those first. One film I found particularly good, although I don't think it ever received that much coverage, is Take Shelter, starring Michael Shannon and Jessica Chastain. The protagonist is a man who is very paranoid. He has nasty nightmares and even apocalyptic visions throughout his day, something which ultimately affects his regular daily life his job and his family. This is one of those frightening films which taunt you, the, which don't present a straightforward, scary, ghastly situation, but which builds dread as the plot goes on. I can't really say too much beyond the fact that this man has these progressively worse visions, um, to not spoil the plot, but let's just say that this film is broadly well reviewed, so I really don't understand why it's rarely suggested or mentioned anywhere. I would definitely recommend it. Another film I enjoyed watching, although I'd never heard about it, I discovered it through a friend, is Four Lions, uh, a very dark comedy about a group of uh, young brainwashed Muslim extremists who live in Sheffield, just your average region of England. Four Lions is very similar to Jojo Rabbit, a film I really like and which was heavily featured at this year's uh, film awards ceremonies. Both these films use irony, satire, dark comedy to prove even how more ridiculous extremist views sound when you take them out of context. Jojo Rabbit did this with Hitler and his Nazi ideology seen through the eyes of a child. And here in Four Lions, the same goes for these young wannabe thug terrorists who obviously have no clue what they're doing or preaching or the consequences of your actions. And just as with Jojo Rabbit, it has you laughing out loud in one scene and bawling your eyes out in the next. Another great film I watched is Seven Psychopaths, starring an ensemble cast including Colin Farrell, Woody Harrelson, Christopher Walken and Sam Rockwell. One of the actors I've been enjoying most watching in the last couple of years and of whom I'm always trying to catch up with more titles. In Seven Psychopaths, a writer is trying to come up with a story about seven psychopaths, while many people in his life also happen to be basically psychopaths, and which gets him involved into much more than he would have preferred. The best aspect of this film is how absurd the dialogues between the protagonists turn out to be. The ideas, the way they interact right until the end. And of course this was yet another film in which I adored Sam Rockwell's performance. Unfortunately I can't speak too much about every single film otherwise this video would be incredibly long but hopefully I'll manage to sum up everything in just a few sentences. But Seven Psychopaths is definitely a film I'd recommend. The next film I enjoyed, but which is definitely not an obscure gem, it's actually considered more of a classic, but which I realized I'd never actually watched was The Blind Side. Honestly, I wasn't actually expecting that much from this film, maybe because of the plain poster, because of how blandly the story is often described, but I really, really enjoyed it. The Blind Side is the story of a teenager with a very difficult and impoverished upbringing who is basically welcomed into a very wealthy family, a family which is completely different from the situations he was used to. Uh, this family offers him a whole new life, new life opportunities, but of course it all comes with a lot of emotions such as feeling even more outcast and discriminated. There is the issue of your biological family versus accepting the new family and so on. So although many scenes were rich in cliches, many others went straight to the point on very touchy subjects. So I'm really pleased I went beyond the posters, went beyond just the descriptions and decided to watch it. Actually, one of the reasons I ended up watching The Blind Side is because it's quoted in another film I watched this month that again covers the topic of um, foster children, of children moving into new families and all the issues that go with that process 
called instant family. Now, instant family is often mistaken as your regular loud slapstick comedy. You have Rose Byrne and uh, Mark Wahlberg who um, decide to, to foster some children and they end up fostering three children at a time and there are a lot of comedic situations, a lot of loud accidents happen, happening and so on. But in reality, it actually gets pretty sad in some moments. It actually touches some very delicate topics. So it's pretty interesting to watch along with, you know, all the funny moments. It's not a superb film, but it's not as terrible as you'd expect either. Now let's jump into something, uh, unfortunately not, not particularly good. <laughs> I watched a series called Summertime. It's an Italian series, but it's produced by Netflix, so it's available in all different languages. To give a little more context as to how bad this series is, uh, it's based on a book by Federico Moccia called Tre metri sopra il cielo, a teen romance novel that at one point even became a film, but which has always been known as a total cringe fest when read or seen by anybody above the age of 14. You basically have to imagine the same polarised reaction the Twilight books had back at the time. Summertime is the story of a group of young friends spending their summer in an Italian seaside town. So you've got all the flirty summer romance, the end of school, summer jobs, new friendships and loves. Now I know many of you who are familiar with the original concept of Tremetri Sopra il Cielo would want me to absolutely trash this series. But in reality, it doesn't actually try to be anything more than just this simple teen uh, summer romance story. It's not that pretentious, so if you're looking for that light, very light depiction of a lazy Italian teenage summer with pizza and pool parties and sunset kisses, and you're willing to put up with awful dialogues and discussions about which emoji is the best to use, there's it's nothing more than that. Next up, I watched a film which I was definitely not expecting to be as terrifying as it turned out to be. The film is Sinister, starring Ethan Hawke. What frightened me the most about this film, apart from the fact that I decided to watch it in the middle of the night alone in the dark of my bedroom, was that the camera never pans away from the scary scenes. Often, in many films, um, the really gruesome, gruesome scenes are only shown for a moment and then the camera will switch to something else or violence is implied. You hardly ever have to just focus for a series of minutes on one really nasty scene. And this is what happens in Sinister because it's based on a series of murders which the killer films and which then we have to watch to the end. And they're not quick murders. The killer sets up long, elaborate, disgusting sets. In addition to that, there's a very creepy villain. So everything in this film made it feel like it was 2009 and I was watching a scary movie with my friends in their basement in the middle of the night. I even watched the sequel, Sinister 2, but it wasn't half as good and many reviews agree with um, negative criticisms. In the sequel, a family who are always on the run away from a dangerous past end up staying in a house which is even more dangerous. It has the same issues as the house from the setting from the first film. The only really frightening moment is the opening scene because you have no idea what's going on and you're just thrust into this scary situation. But after that, it's not as good. The, the first film is the real deal. Next up is the, the F word, also known in some countries as what if a romantic comedy starring Daniel Radcliffe as a guy who recently went through a breakup and who is struggling to socially mingle. He has a very ironic way of interacting and he eventually gets back on the dating scene, even under suggestion of his best friend portrayed by Adam Driver. It's not the romantic comedy, but it's pretty fun and witty. I really like the dialogues, especially on behalf of Radcliffe. And this film actually gives off a very similar vibe to another romantic comedy I watched this month called uh, Carrie Pilby, in which the protagonist is a young woman who excels incredibly on an academic level. She is very well read, she has a good job, but she is awful with social interactions, especially relationships. So the film follows her around in her daily life and in particular um, in the situation of her getting back into the dating scene, started to meet new people and basically pushing herself beyond her comfort zone. Again, these are not award winners, they're 
you know, just simple romantic comedies, but at least they have that little bit of, uh, of funnier dialogues, or wittier dialogues, with it, which give them that extra something. And of course, all with a bit of background melancholy sprinkled all over. Then, as May was the month in which Capone with Tom Hardy was going to be released, I realised I hadn't actually ever seen that many films covering the topic of uh, this infamous gangster Al Capone, and I decided to watch one of the most famous films on the topic called The Untouchables, a film I'd be meaning to watch anyway at some point, it was on my watch list. The Untouchables stars Robert De Niro as the infamous mobster Al Capone, with Kevin Costner, Sean Connery, Andy Garcia ganging up to bring him down. If you're a lover of the older gangster movies from the 70s and 80s, but more on the police investigation side of things, rather than the only the mob point of view, this could be a good choice. After watching The Untouchables, I could finally watch Capone, one of the most awaited films of the year, but which people stopped talking about very quickly after, after its release, mostly because it was completely different from everybody's expectations. And although I enjoyed it for its uncommon approach to the topic, it has some very big flaws. There is a full, a spoiler-free review up on my channel, I'll leave that linked, but briefly summed up, it's the story of Capone after his years at the height of his criminal activity, and on the contrary, when he was more of a slave of his physical and mental illness. So the premise of the plot is pretty interesting. You see this king of criminality under a very different point of view, but the story definitely wasn't faultless. It was quite repetitive and it never expanded or went deeper on the subject than it could have. And there are also many big issues with uh, the way Italian was spoken in the film. But I'll leave the link to the full spoiler-free review so you can get a, a, a better idea about that. Then around this time of The Untouchables and Capone, I realised there were many Tom Hardy films I had never watched. Now the first one I wanted to catch up with was another gangster film, or to better say, a film about two twin gangsters both portrayed by Tom Hardy. Uh, the film is Legend, in which he portrays the Cray twins, who used to have an organised crime um, scheme in London during the 50s and 60s. The absolute best feature of this film is how Tom Hardy conveyed how these two twins grew up together, basically did everything together right down to their daily job, but while still being two very different people, with very different ways of running business, treating others, envisioning the world, etc. This is one of the films I'd probably recommend the most out of all the titles on today's list. The other Tom Hardy film I watched is Lock, uh, famously known as uh, the movie in which we just see Tom Hardy sitting in his car, driving through the night and making a series of phone calls or, or receiving phone calls. Uh, now this obviously sounds like a very boring plot or some pretentious hipster rubbish but in reality, it's really, really engaging, and it proves how good of an actor, good an actor Tom Hardy is, because there is basically nothing else in the film. The story is literally just his character driving through the night and making and receiving a series of phone calls which reveal what he is doing, where he is going, and some important facts about his life. Another interesting fact, if you're a film lover, is that everybody on the other side of the phone uh, is voiced by very famous actors, uh, for example, Olivia Colman, Andrew Scott, even Tom Holland. Then last month, I also finally watched Detective Pikachu, a movie I had meant to watch back at the time when it was in cinemas, but here we are, a couple of years later. Detective Pikachu is a film which attracts younger audiences, but at the same time, all the older, fans of Pokemon as it sets the Pokemon in a, in a real world as it is a live action film and that's basically it was basically everybody's dream as children to have Pokemon in in your actual real life in the story the protagonist is investigating the mysterious disappearance of his father along with one of the most famous Pokemon Pikachu of course the story gets thicker but the best part for all the lovers of that world is seeing all the various Pokemon we grew up with, their peculiar features, etc. I then watched an interesting documentary called Belluscone, A Sicilian Story. The title is based on an Italian politician who uh, is famous in Italy and around the world for his way of doing politics, uh, his way of interacting, his incredible wealth, 
his exhibitionist personality, as well as many controversial and illegal activities he carried out. Without getting into politics, he, he's basically one of those figures who are either absolutely hated or absolutely adored. And this documentary focuses on how his life and wealth tie in with the Mafia, all set in the cultural environment of the musical sensation of Cantanti Neomelodici. I said it in Italian because I don't think there is a direct translation of the term. Basically, these Cantanti Neomelodici are singers who perform a very specific genre, which is a very popular, especially in the south of Italy, to the point that various neighbourhoods will have their own star, their musical idol. And Berlusconi and the Mafia all tie into this, and it's a very interesting story, more of an investigation onto a topic many don't really want to speak about. Um, the other documentary I watched was Going Clear, Scientology and the Prison of Belief. As the title suggests, the topic is the religious belief of Scientology, which has always been associated with controversies, criticisms and a lot of mystery, especially because regardless of its dubious methods, it is practiced by many celebrities. As I didn't know much about Scientology, except for all these very vague pieces of information I had managed to patch together over the course of the years, I really appreciated how this documentary doesn't give anything for granted. It just, it, it explains everything from A to Z with interviews, even to former members. So it, it gives you a comprehensive view of the whole topic. Then I came across a film called How I Live Now, which features a lot of famous actors, but when they were younger and definitely not as well known as they are today. Uh, Tom Holland, uh, Saoirse Ronan, George McKay. And the story is set in a near future in which the world is on edge with bombings and riots and acts of terrorism and the area in which the protagonists are staying ends up being right at the center of one of these attacks. I don't want to say too much. In my opinion, even the trailers show a little too much. They go a little too much into the spoilers. But basically those events trigger a whole dramatic situation in which these young protagonists who are left on their own have to figure out what to do. That is the vaguest description I've ever given about a film. Next up was a pretty peculiar film called The Love Witch. It doesn't particularly stand out because of the plot, but because of its whole aesthetic. The entire movie is meant to look like a much older project, something out of the 60s, but at the same time it covers topics you would expect from a modern socially conscious film like gender roles and the meaning of relationships. As a matter of fact, this film received a lot of publicity on uh, social media platforms like Tumblr, where these two things come together, and that is actually where I discovered it, uh, mistaken it uh, for, a very old, for a much older film. The protagonist of the film is a witch who uses her powers to overpower men, make them fall in love, with terrible consequences. If I have to be honest, in the end, I didn't particularly enjoy this film. Uh, it was not really my kind of thing, if we can describe it like that. But if you're looking for something completely different from many other titles out there, because I've never seen anything like this, it could be an interesting choice. I then watched a movie called Death at a Funeral, which I later found out is actually a remake of another film uh, of the same name. The reason I ended up picking this film is because I was on the lookout for some dark comedies, and this popped up as recommended, although with mixed reviews. Now, it wasn't exactly what I was going for, I was looking for something more on the lines of Swiss Army Man. This is a more of a straightforward slapstick comedy, but with a dark setting. As a matter of fact, the film features a funeral, an event in which many relatives get together, each bringing their own issues, their different personalities, hidden information, and all of that clashes. Um, if you do have any recommendations for good dark comedies, feel free to leave them in the comments down below. Next up was a film called The Ritual. Actually, a pretty underrated Netflix horror film. Although it's not an exceptional cult horror film, many have compared the atmosphere it gives off to that of other good horror films like The Witch, or um, even movies based on Stephen King works like 1922 and In the Tall Grass. In this story, in, in The Ritual, a group of friends decide to go on a long hike in the Scandinavian wilderness. 
in memory of a close friend of theirs. Everything's fine until they start to witness scarier and scarier events, which eventually become life-threatening. One of the elements I appreciated the most about this film was the mood amongst the friends, who were often discussing, bickering about which way they should have gone, whose fault it is about the whole situation, something which is pretty realistic compared to those films in which you just have all the friends we're all on the strong team here. I then rewatched uh, a film called The Day the Earth Stood Still, uh, a movie I've actually seen quite a few times because it's uh, often shown on TV here in Italy and I've always found it pretty interesting. Although this is a quite a big project with a big cast, this is actually one of Keanu Reeves's lesser known films. But if you like films uh, like Arrival, which question our presence here on Earth, uh, our claim of planet Earth belonging to us, uh, of the threat of aliens, without becoming a war of the world scenario, this could be a good choice for you. Basically, Keanu Reeves portrays an alien who arrives on planet Earth uh, with a specific mission, and his arrival and his way of thinking put to the test the mind of many scientists and politicians and high-ranking military personnel who all believe they have the stronghold on their position here on Earth. Next I watched a film which was actually recommended to me by one of you and that is Castaway on the Moon, a touching and beautiful Korean film about a man who is stranded on a desert island but not somewhere in the middle of the Pacific Ocean but rather in the middle of a river crossing Seoul, the capital of Korea. As he is stuck alone, left to the conditions of the island, he starts to reflect uh, about his life, while the other protagonist is a young woman who lives her life as a hikikomori, withdrawn from society in the small space of one room from which she only spies outside through camera lenses. This is one of those films which is completely different from anything I've seen in the last few months. And I also think it's one of those films which could be replicated uh, concerning the setting, so a guy stranded on a desert island, but not with the same analysis. So thank you so much for the recommendation. The other Korean film I watched is The Host by Pong Joon-ho. Hopefully I've managed to nail his pronunciation finally. Uh, but basically the director behind very famous films such as Snowpiercer, Okjaya, Parasite, which basically won everything at this year's film awards. And the next film of his that I want to watch is Memories of a Murder. Hopefully you'll see me speaking about that in next month's video. I love The Host. I'm so pleased I finally watched it. Um, it is absolutely terrifying, but at the same time it has a lot of irony, something which you can also see in Parasite. Basically, in The Host, a huge, frightening amphibian monster attacks the city, it feeds on people, and it specifically attacks the, the group of protagonists, their family. But this is not your regular monster film about a, just a huge creature attacking a city and everybody fighting back in an epic style. A large portion of the film is uh, dedicated to the character arc, the character development, the relationship among, among these members of the family, their love and grief and irony. Definitely recommended. I then watched a film which was uh, one of your most suggested titles a few months back when I asked for some feel-good movies, and that is The Secret Life of Walter Mitty. This film had actually never really intrigued me. I always thought it was more of just a sentimental, quote-ridden plot and nothing more. But I ended up really enjoying it, mostly because of its use of deadpan irony. It covers the incredibly regular life of a man who is often made fun of at his workplace, he's stuck in shy mode, he never picks up the courage to go beyond his comfort zone, and his way of compensating all of this, of escaping, is having fantastic visions in which he imagines himself doing all sorts of fun things, answering back to his bullies, fulfilling his adventures, all until one day a problem at his workplace requires him to actually kind of uh, do these adventures, to go beyond his comfort zone. Uh, it's a sort of a yes man movie, but um, with a more serious approach. Next I watched a film which was actually one of the most low-key titles uh, of the month, uh, called Columbus. 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 It's a story of a young woman who lives in Columbus, Ohio, and who is a huge architecture enthusiast. She is in that phase of young adulthood when you have to make choices about your future, about your career, about your family, 
and she eventually meets a man arriving from South Korea and who is also dealing with family issues. The plot of this film is incredibly composed. There is nothing huge going on. It's just this natural development of a relationship without having to necessarily put something hyper dramatic into the story. On the contrary, a big element of the film is architecture, which is heavily featured in the film, heavily spoken about. So there are beautiful shots of various locations and buildings around the city. Another very low key film is a garden state, which actually has a sort of young adult cult film status, although I don't really see what all the hype about it is. I just didn't feel very captivated by it. Zach Braff portrays a young, depressed, struggling actor who is dealing with a loss in his family, for which he moves back to his hometown where he meets all his old acquaintances. He also meets and befriends Natalie Portman's character and they spend time together in that delicate moment of, of life of falling completely into adulthood, letting go of the past, etc. I might have to watch this again at some point in the future because I must be missing something if it's considered one of the best films of all time. I then watched Adventureland, which covers uh, similar topics, but with a more comedic, uh, uh, coming of age uh, um, perspective. Kristen Stewart, Jesse Eisenberg, Ryan Reynolds, Bill Hader, Kristen Wiig all portray various characters analysed within one summer during the 80s, during which new friendships and love stories develop, along with jealousies, personal growths, and decision-making about the future. It's not particularly deep, for example, compared to Garden State, it has a more of a, of a funner approach to the topic. I read one review which describes the events of the film as youthful summer misadventures, and I think that perfectly sums it up. Next, I caught up with a film I, I hadn't really planned on, on watching at the moment, but which so many were hailing as uh, one of the films that was snobbed the most at this year's Film Awards, so I decided to watch it myself and form my own opinion. Now that film is Hustlers, starring an ensemble cast with Jennifer Lopez, Constance Wu, uh, Julia Stiles, Lily Reinhardt, Kiki Palmer, and even celebrities like Cardi B. Hustlers covers the real story of a group of strippers who worked at fancy nightclubs where the richest came and paid big money, but of which very little eventually trickled down to their paychecks. So these women decide to run their own business, uh, to work on their own with these very rich clients, uh, but basically scamming them, just ripping as much money possible off of them. But things of course get out of hand. Although JLo is pretty good in this film, I don't agree that it was an Oscar winning performance, uh, but it was pretty interesting. I appreciated how this film took matters seriously. It went straight to the point on a subject which is not really spoken that much in such an open manner. Another film which uh, instead was anticipated with very excited comments making viewers basically expect an award-winning performance was The Assistant. But after watching it, I couldn't agree more with the top voted tags on Google to describe it. Slow, boring, overrated, forgettable. I think it received a lot of good reviews from big institutions because of the topic it covers, which necessarily implies it being a good movie, but in the end, audiences didn't enjoy it. It's uh, the story of an unfair workplace. A woman is treated in a rather demeaning manner. Although she has good qualifications, she simply has to clear up after others literally even the crumbs from their food. She is shouted on the phone or from a boss. Other people with less qualifications are treated better than she is, even offered better positions. But the main problem with this film and one of its biggest criticisms is that it uh, all happens over the course of one day, maybe two. And what actually happens isn't exactly that terrible. For example, instead of getting to the point, the film focuses on some scenes such as this assistant washing up uh, mugs in the, in the rest area and other colleagues just leaving their stuff for her to clean up too. I know that's all annoying and I know that's just one thing piled on top of many others, but there are so many moments in this film which make it feel like it doesn't really want to tackle the, the subject of harassment at work. It's as if on Bombshell, a film which covers sexual harassment on the workplace, 
Margot Robbie's character complained about having to throw away her co-worker's sandwich wrapping. Anyway, uh, I then watched a film called Black Snake Moan, uh, another suggestion on your behalf and in which Christina Ricci portrays uh, a woman with sex addiction and who lives in a small rural town. Her struggles increase when her boyfriend leaves for the military, uh, leaving her basically alone. After a particularly nasty episode, she is noticed by an older man in the town, portrayed by Samuel L. Jackson, who decides to keep her restrained in his home in an attempt to fix her situation. Now, because of how the film opens and because of some promotional material, the film looks like it's going down the super erotic path. But in reality, it's sadder. It touches a lot of topics like anxiety and religion and lack of faith and responsibility and desire. So it ended up taking a very mature approach to the topic and it actually made me uh, want to watch uh, Shame with Michael Fassbender, another film which also speaks about sex addiction. Then I watched yet another horror film, I think I watched quite a few this month, uh, called Gretel and Hansel. Uh, quite a lesser known horror movie, but which covers the classic children's story of two kids lured into a witch's house in the middle of the woods with very grim consequences. Um, now, a lot of old classic children's legends and stories were actually pretty creepy. I haven't confirmed this yet, but one of my literature teachers in high school once said that uh, in Cinderella, in the original story of Cinderella, people would cut off pieces of their feet in order to, to fit the shoe. Pretty gross. Anyway, this new Gretel and Hansel film follows suit and many scenes are made to look like they just came out of a creepy, twisted nightmare. And one of the most frightening aspects is uh, the cinematography, these very, very weird settings. And you might recognise Gretel as Sophia Lillis, who has been starring in many darker projects, for example, the two new IT films, as well as the Netflix series I Am Not Okay With This. Another horror film with a similar ambiance is Goodnight Mummy, um, an Austrian film about a woman who goes through some pretty extensive facial surgery, uh, she wears all these bandages on her face and she lives alone with her two sons, her two twin sons, um, far away from everybody else in this huge house in which there are very strict rules to follow. Now, everything in this film defies viewers' expectations. The plot uh, takes turns you wouldn't expect and that's one of the elements I enjoyed the most and which made the film stand out. Uh, the plot opens with the two twins becoming suspicious about their mother's behaviour after a surgery and while they try to figure out more about the situations, things get completely out of control. Instead, a film I wouldn't describe as a horror, but just as a very, 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 very weird film is Splice. This film jumps from pure science fiction to drama to heartbreak into just pure gross and creepy you have to watch it to understand what, what I mean. It's the story of a couple, who are also scientists, who are working on a project to combine human and animal DNA in the hope of making a breakthrough in new ways to cure certain diseases. But they get carried away with their project and create a terrifying new creature, but who has a lot of potential and a lot to discover. And I'm not going to say any more than that, because from that point, the film just flings itself down a roller coaster of a million different emotions. Actually, the reason I discovered this film uh, was by watching those short videos on Facebook and uh, people were commenting under the trailer saying uh, that, that if you watch the film, it's basically like worshiping the devil and you're, uh, you're going against God. And I hope they understood that was a trailer, not actual scientists trying to do this. Anyway, uh, a, an interesting film, let's say. Next, I watched 21 Jump Street, a film which used to be very popular, but which I never actually got round to watching. In the story, Channing Tatum and Jonah Hill portray two police officers who go undercover in a high school in order to bust a drug distribution scheme. Uh, at school, they meet and befriend other students, including uh, one in particular portrayed by Dave Franco. I think this film was so successful because it never takes itself seriously. It's actually more of a parody uh, of, 
of the genre, of a lot of things that go on in films which cover similar topics. The downside is that I read there are plans to, to make a remake, a spin-off, something like that with a female led cast, something unnecessary and uh, which we have seen, for example, happen in 2006 with the Ghostbusters film. Anyway, uh, next I watched Just Mercy, uh, a film which had completely passed under my radar, but which I loved and which had me in tears. It's a true story of black people in the United States wrongly incarcerated and sentenced to death without any possibility of basically proving their innocence. The plot focuses on one inmate in particular, portrayed by Jamie Foxx, and his very determined lawyer, portrayed by Michael B. Jordan. Now this is a very interesting and touching subject which gets you thinking a lot, especially in the present situation. I then watched The Wailing, a Japanese film I had saved on my watch list and which I decided to watch after it was also suggested to me by you guys. Now The Wailing is a very scary horror film. The most frightening factor being that the camera doesn't pan away from the gruesome moments, just as with Sinister I was mentioning earlier. It's the story of a series of murders in a small town and the police investigation on the matter, with the detectives looking into a mysterious man who just arrived in town. The only element I didn't like of this film is just how long it is. This film is an Irishman. It's three or four hours long when the plot could have easily fitted in half of the time, but a very frightening film nonetheless. Next up on the list is Logan Lucky, in which Channing Tatum and Adam Driver portray two brothers who decide to organise a huge robbery with the help of a very clever inmate portrayed by Daniel Craig. The heist part itself is engaging, but when you add on to this the dialogues, the deadpan comedy that derives from them and a great cast, it all becomes even better. I still can't realise I only watch this now. Next I watched a film called Seberg, starring Kristen Stewart as uh, Jean Seberg, uh, a famous actress who during the 60s became even more notable for siding with the Black Panther Party, a famous movement within the US for the rights of black citizens, but which was also considered by the United States as a big violent threat. So of course her presence uh, with high-ranking members within that group was uh, the cause for a, a very in-depth investigation. I'm very pleased I watched this film because I didn't know nearly anything about the actress or about her involvement with the group. Then I watched another horror film called Drag Me to Hell, which is actually a, a, a classic in early 2000s horror movies. This film is actually quite scary. I think it won quite a few awards in the genre. Uh, but at the same time, it also has some very cringeworthy moments. It shifts from some scenes in which you have to cover your eyes to, to, in order to watch it, to others which look straight out of a parody film. So it actually turns out to be one of those great films to watch with your friends shouted at the screen. It depicts the legend of certain gypsy women casting curses if they aren't helped or if they are put in difficult situations. In particular, the protagonist denies a mortgage extension to an elderly gypsy woman and ends up being haunted by a curse set on her. Again, not a masterpiece, but definitely a fun horror movie. Then I watched Pride, a film based on the true story of a group of activists for the LGBT plus rights during the 80s who um, end up in Wales supporting miners and a fa famous miners strike. Now, already the LGBT plus movement wasn't exactly seen in a good eye back at the times, but let's say that Wales, in addition to that, isn't exactly your multicultural Berlin kind of environment. So the film ends up being both a mix of touching movements, and but with a ton of comedy, and it actually has quite a big cast with Bill Nye, Andrew Scott, George McKay, and it also has a great soundtrack. Then I watched a film I was definitely not expecting to turn out the way it did, and that is Warm Bodies, uh, set in a world in which a huge part of the population has become violent zombies. But one of these zombies, portrayed by Nicholas Holt, is actually still able to process normal human thoughts, normal feelings, and he is also often critical of the other zombies. So when he meets a regular human, the outcome is very different than expected. 
I think this film aims to sort of an edgy alternative section of the teenage audience in a sort of twilight manner. But in the end, it's actually pretty interesting for a wider audience. I was definitely not expecting it to be how it is, especially because of its very good use of irony. Instead, another film I watched, uh, a Netflix film, uh, is called Lovebirds, which is basically Netflix's perfect algorithm for a fun romantic comedy with a lot of action sprinkled in it. In Lovebirds, a couple who is on the verge of breaking up end up witnessing a murder and everything makes it look like they are the culprits. So while they're trying to run away from the scene and clear their name, they unfold an even larger scheme and adventure. Again, it's a very calculated film. It's not as bad as you would expect, but at the same time, I'm not planning on re-watching it anytime soon. Another cheesy romantic comedy I watched again on Netflix was The Breakup, in which uh, Vince Vaughn and Jennifer Aniston portray another couple who just can't get over their, their differences and they decide to take some time apart. Um, and while they're spending their time apart, they start to think about their situation, about their relationship, but they uh, realize a lot of things. And there's also a lot of comedy. Uh, for example, uh, Jennifer Aniston brings new hot boyfriends to the house to show off for how she is doing. Um, there are a lot of moments like this. In my opinion, there is nothing particularly interesting in this film. It never goes full funny and it never goes full emotional. It's just this regular breakup, nothing more than that. I don't think I'd recommend it. But I then watched a romantic film which is on a totally different level, Romeo and Juliet, which I am absolutely mind blown. I only watch now as I love another film by the same director, Baz Luhrmann, uh, with a similar themes and a similar atmosphere, Moulin Rouge. So there's romance, but mixed with a lot of sadness. Uh, Roman Juliet, in this case, is a modern adaptation of Shakespeare's famous piece, famous work um, about two lovers but who can't be together because they belong to two rival families. And it all culminates with a tragic, epic, dramatic ending. Now, as this is a modern adaptation, it is set in Los Angeles. The rival families are rival gangs with a huge mafia-style hatred. They're guns and drugs and fancy cars and parties. There isn't really a specific way to describe Lerman's style, as it's a mix of very peculiar elements, sudden shifts in the editing, the music, the dialogues, so you have sped up scenes, quirk interactions, followed by epic wide dramatic shots, distinctive music choices in unexpected scenes. If you've never seen Romeo Juliet or Moulin Rouge, I would definitely recommend trying them out. Towards the end of the month, I then watched uh, Space Force, a Netflix series I absolutely loved, and which is basically The Office, but set within a military environment, as the protagonist is a general, portrayed by Steve Carell, of this new branch of the army called Space Force, which is basically dedicated to missions in space. The cast also includes Diana Silvers, who's slowly entering many interesting projects, John Malkovich, Jimmy Young, Lisa Kudrow, and the dialogues are hilarious. The Space Force program is of course challenging to run and the protagonist is barely flexible. He follows a very military rigid lifestyle, something which makes it hard for him to find time for his family. And at the same time, he is constantly under pressure by his colleagues, by his superiors, and by the president's uh, constant tweets. This is one of the series I enjoyed watching the most lately. And if you're on the lookout for a ton of irony and satirical hints, this is for you. Then I decided to try out Disney+, Plus, which is basically the only streaming platform on which you can find Disney films, Disney series, everything Disney, uh, but that also means all the Marvel films, a National Geographic documentaries, the Pirates of the Caribbean, Star Wars, basically a bunch of stuff you wouldn't immediately associate with Disney. I only tried it for a short period of time because there's no way I'm paying more uh, because I'm not exactly a huge Disney fan. Uh, and so I tried to squeeze everything on my watch list into this small period of time. I had originally decided to get it for The Mandalorian, the Star Wars series, which was a huge success last year. But in the end, for one reason or the other, I only got to about an episode and a half, 
I will catch up with it sometime in the future. Most of the titles on my Disney watch list for Disney Plus were the new animated films as I'd seen most of the older classic animated films over the course of, of the years of my childhood. And um, the new animated films I watched were Inside Out, Coco, Toy Story 4, Moana and Up. Out of all the four, Inside Out is probably the one I enjoyed the most and I can understand why I received so many positive reviews and so many awards. I think it even won an Oscar for Best Animated Film and I think that Inside Out is one of those films both children and adults will enjoy for very different reasons and one of those films which leaves food for thought for all age groups. The characters are the emotions inside Little Girl's brain so while the plot follows her grown up and go through many changes in her life the emotions have to provide the correct reactions and feelings so there are anger, joy, sadness, disgust, etc. All with their specific features. So the story is bright and fun and it teaches how to respond to your emotions, but also with a very creative depiction of how the inside of our brain and our body works. The other movie I enjoyed watching the most is Moana, uh, of which I adored the imagery and just how different it is from many other Disney films. I think to find a similar setting you have to go back 20 years to uh, Lilo and Stitch. Moana is set in a Polynesian village in which the protagonist sets off on a mission to save her island, meeting demigods and sea creatures and all sorts of adventures. Instead, another award-winning film was Coco, which won a ton of awards, but in which I didn't see all the excitement. I didn't feel as incredibly touched and moved as others have described, so I'm going to leave this up to your personal view and your personal taste. One thing I did like about Coco, just as with Moana, is how different it is from many other Disney films. In this case, because of how it covers the topic of death. Many Disney films include the element of death, usually a parent passing away or a character surviving all odds. In Coco instead, most of the film is set within the land of the dead and it speaks directly of the topic as the protagonist accidentally enters the land of the afterlife and has to go through a series of adventures in order to get back. It's inspired by the Mexican tradition of Dia de los Muertos, the Day of the Dead, and in general of how many Latin cultures deeply engage in maintaining the memory of the dead, carrying out traditions concerning the dead, whereas in other cultures we tend to not think about it so much, although it is a big part of life. Then Up was another film many found, found emotional and I also felt moved, touched by it. It's the story of an elderly man who loses his wife, basically his best friend, his partner of a lifetime, and in addition to that, a construction company wants to buy his last memory with her, their house. So to be freed of everything, he flies his house away using hundreds of balloons and sets off on an adventure with a little boy scout who had got stuck on the decking before takeoff. The element I liked most here was the mature approach to the depiction of the elderly, who in many films are treated in a very demeaning manner, they are shown just as a, a weak, uh, that they don't understand anything anymore, they're just boring grannies and grandpas sitting on the couch, people who basically can't do anything anymore. But this film shows a completely different reality. I then watched Toy Story 4, the last film in the Toy Story franchise which had been basically going on for 30 years since the 90s. The film maintains all the old classic toys who come alive, but to who they also added Forky, an arts and crafts project made at kindergarten. So a really messy spork with googly eyes and wire arms who thinks he always has to be in the trash. I think that when you get to the end of a franchise, such a huge franchise, it's very hard to put together um, everybody's vision of how the story must end. But I think that in the end, it was pretty well carried out. I also actually watched a couple of non-animated Disney films. Uh, the first one is one I don't even really want to talk about because there is not that much I would recommend about it, but I will quickly mention it, and that is Tomorrowland, which plays a lot on the element of the geeky, science-loving kids who always want to push the boundaries and discover more about the world. That is not a new topic. There are many films out there which cover the, this same element with way more interesting plots. Very briefly summed up, in Tomorrowland, a kid finds a coin which allows her to enter another world another dimension, but upon entering that world, the adventure gets bigger and more dangerous. Instead, an animated, a non-animated film 
a non-animated Disney film, which I really enjoyed, was Mary Poppins Returns, which is the sequel to uh, the first chapter, Mary Poppins film, which came out over 50 years ago. Mary Poppins is a sort of magical nanny who looks after children and cares for their whole family while she tries to spread happiness and positivity and teach people to never abandon the joys of childhood. All those little things that used to make us so happy and which we seem to forget about when we grow up. As a lover of the old Mary Poppins, I found this was a very well put together sequel and a way of maintaining the memory of Mary Poppins. By the way, speaking of Disney+, Plus, one of the reasons why I didn't want to keep my subscription that long, in addition to the fact that I'm not a huge Disney fan, was that it's not a very well developed app. I found it very buggy, uh, it crashed a lot, and also it doesn't really have everything Disney as it claims to have. For example, one of the films I wanted to watch was uh, Christopher Robin, and I had to wait like a whole month for it to come out. So I know that's a very pity, a very first world problem, but when you're speaking of such a huge corporation as Disney, which claims that you have everything, access to everything on the app, Anyway, that's pettiness aside. In the end, I managed to watch Christopher Robin. Um, it's the story of the famous character Winnie the Pooh and his owner, Christopher Robin, who grows up. He's moved into the world of responsibility and work and he's you know, sad and, and depressed. And he meets up with Winnie the Pooh many years later uh, with their differences and all the news in their life. Okay, Disney Plus aside, um, I had to make a commissioned video for a company about a series of action movies, so I had to catch up with a few famous titles I hadn't watched yet. Uh, the first was Taken, uh, the famous film in which Liam Neeson says, I will look for you, I will find you, and I will kill you. This is actually a pretty impressive action film because it's basically all about this one father who is willing to do anything necessary in order to find his daughter who has been kidnapped on the other side of the world by a group of mysterious men. But they pick the wrong guy to mess with as he's a former CIA agent and he's basically just a slightly older John Wick. Also for that video I watched uh, The Transporter which is so exaggerated that you basically end up watching it just to see how over the top, how more over the top the action will get, how even cheesier the dialogues will get. Um, in the story, Jason Statham portrays a driver whose job is to deliver anything, anywhere with no questions asked until he is given um, a very particular mission which gets out of control. This is not an excellent film, but it's basically drag me to hell in the action sense. So one of those films you'd watch with your friends to just shout out the screen at how ridiculous it's getting. Um, for the same video, I also watched Six Underground in which instead Ryan Reynolds leads um, a group of people who basically fake their own death in order to be free from any common life burden and who use this power to try take down criminal organizations, terrorist leaders, groups who regular governments don't really want to deal with. They never really try to tackle. So this group basically operates under the radar and the story also gets very ironic. There are many moments which look like they are parodies of the usual tropes you would see in action films. But then at the same time, it does always fall into the same cliches, so I wouldn't particularly recommend it. Um, and while the last action film I watched for that video was 12 Strong. Uh, because the month before I had seen Extraction, another action film with Chris Hemsworth, and here in 12 Strong, again, there is Chris Hemsworth um, as the leader of, well, it's a true story, the leader of one of the first groups, troops of soldiers sent to Afghanistan after the events of 9-11. So the film is interesting because of the different setting of these rural regions and how, of course, combat techniques had to change to adapt to that environment showing really how tough war situations can get. And with that, we've reached the end of today's list. If you're still watching, thank you so, so much for sticking right until the end. I hope you enjoyed this video and also I would love to hear what you've been watching and what you think about these titles I've spoken about today, what you'd recommend. Let me know everything with a comment down below. 
if you enjoyed this video, make sure to subscribe and I'll see you soon in the next one. Bye.